uh, let's start with an introduction for the class. Hello, everyone out there. This week is a, is a total virtual mashup. Um, this time, uh, some part of us is virtual, but the speaker is actually in the room. We have Mark Benson from Samsung, who is the head of uh, Samsung Smart Things. And uh, this week, in, um, we're on week five. It's about IoT, robots, and the metaverse. And uh, it's wonderful to have Mark uh, speaking in the class and to the class because um, it's, it's fascinating to see the story of Mark Things and what Samsung is doing there. Um, connecting all your your home and everything, and um, it's fascinating from my perspective over the over the last years to see the kind of dynamic that happens in in the connected home and with new standards. I I don't want to take too much, but I'm uh, deeply impressed with the work that Mark and his team is doing over there and the achievements that they have done in the industry. And so I'm very looking forward to hear from you, Mark. So take it away. All right, great. Thanks, Valentin. Appreciate it. I'm uh, happy happy to be here today. Sorry. <laughs> and like Valentin said, my name is Mark Benson, and I'm the head of Samsung SmartThings um, in the US. Um, I want to just thank you for having me here today. And what I have today is a presentation that I hope is informative and maybe a little bit fun about the smart home. Um, and it's it's titled Infinite Diversity in Infinite Combinations, the Birth of the True Smart Home. So we'll get, get into it here. But first I wanted to share um, a little bit. Let's see, let me get the slides here. There we go. Okay, so first a little bit about Samsung SmartThings. So SmartThings as a company is about 10 years old. So it was started as a Kickstarter campaign and then it was acquired by Samsung in 2014. So since that time, it's grown to be the smart home platform for Samsung's connected living strategy. Um, so today we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Samsung and uh, very much in the center. Now, from the beginning, SmartThings has been focused on interoperability. That's a big reason why we started was to bring together the smart home. Now, things were very different 10 years ago than they are today. Uh, but that overriding goal of um, having all of our devices work together has been something that we've been working on uh, for the last decade. So we've been pioneers in that space uh, since that time. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, me. So uh, my, my background, uh, the first part of my career was in um, systems and software engineering. So I spent a lot of time on um, industrial scientific applications like designing flash chromatography instruments, uh, military applications like uh, military combat radios that were used for um, allies of US forces in terms of like head mounted displays, being able to show situational awareness of what's happening on the battlefield. Also things like implantable pacemakers and defibrillators, tactical wearable cameras, a wide variety of uh, devices uh, that I worked on there. And then um, as a result of that, I ended up uh, publishing a textbook here. So this, I'm the author of The Art of Software Thermal Management for Embedded Systems that's published through Springer Verilog. And it's really a book about thermodynamics, but it's for software engineers for how to control the thermodynamic behavior of computing systems with software. So not just using heat sinks and uh, convection and uh, those kind of things, but actually how you can use software to reduce uh, the power that devices use and, and in the result, re uh, reduce the heat. So that's that's a textbook that I wrote that came out of uh, some of the work that was done early in my career. And then I spent um, about seven years as uh, CTO of an industrial Internet of Things company called Exosite. And that uh, company would use data from machines, uh, things like forklifts or um, sensors in factories to be able to detect uh, when machines were maybe becoming unhealthy or when predictive maintenance needs to be scheduled. So that was, I did a lot of work in the internet of things, but it was more an industrial focus for that time. And then now most recently I've been with Samsung smart things for the last four, just over four years that I've been uh, with them leading smart things. 
So today in the agenda, they have three parts that we want to go through. And the first part is really um, smart home industry trends. So I want to share a little bit about what's been happening in the smart home industry um, and what's currently happening right now that we're in this really interesting time in the industry. I also want to talk about interoperability standards that are happening in the industry. I mentioned Matter before. I want to tell you more about Matter and the story behind that and why that's so interesting. And then the new doors of innovation that that is now opening up. And then I also want to share a bit about smart home experiences that are now possible and becoming more possible uh, because of these interoperability standards. So first, let's dive in to smart home industry trends. The smart home industry has doubled in size in the last five years. Um, it's really seen significant growth. And according to Statista, which I'm referencing here, it is forecasted to grow double digits over the next five years. So this has been massive growth and it's happened even in the midst of the pandemic, work from home culture, et cetera. It has really um, continued to grow as people even spend more times in their homes Home remodeling projects have really increased in the last few years, uh, but also adoption of smart home tech has really grown a lot too. So that's what's happening broadly. But in homes, we're still we're still in the first inning of this uh, smart home growth. I've been in it for a long time now, but really this is very early days. I would say in the smart home. Now, in the last of of all the device the device owners in the US, so people who own smart devices in their home, 50% of those started their journey just in the last three years. So if you think about that, that's like just right before the uh, essentially COVID started. And so that's massive growth. That's half of the market has really started that journey in the last three years. Um, three quarters of smart device owners started with one device. So people are not uh, designing with a master plan of here's how I'm going to lay out my whole home with hundreds of devices or paying somebody to do that. There are people that do that, but it's it's very small numbers. Most people are buying like uh, one device or a bundle of devices, things like TV and lights, or they're or buying just a lock or they're buying a thermostat. And so their smart homes are starting small and they're growing. And then the last statistic here that's on the screen is that 80% of all homes in the U.S. now have at least one smart device in them. So that's huge coverage, uh, right? So, so we're seeing with that, that as that coverage is expanded, we're seeing a higher interest from women. The average household income for smart homes has, has lowered as smart home tech has become uh, more within reach of more homes. We're also seeing uh, rapid adoption by renters and, and also uh, diversity metrics that are approaching the general population. So we're really seeing a change from what was, which is more early adopters and enthusiasts to now really it's becoming a mass market um, area of interest. So that's kind of what's happening uh, with some of the demographics. Now, if we look a little bit closer at the devices uh, that people are buying, you can see the list on the left is a list of devices that are the, the best selling uh, devices today. And the list on the right is the list of the fastest growing devices. So you'll see on the left, there's things like smart speakers, makes sense, um, light bulbs, doorbells, thermostats, uh, but also smart security systems. But on the right, in terms of the fastest growing, it's not as much the smart home security systems that are fast growing. But you see other things like um, indoor and outdoor video cameras, as an example. So there's a couple of things just to note on, on this slide is that um, consumers are making individual choices about their devices, um, where the, the number of choices that they have available to them um, they become they have more choices so they're able to do that they're also less likely to just pay a uh, a firm or a service to just uh, build their smart home for them um, and this is also opening up new doors for innovation for things like uh, additional applications on top of this foundation of interoperable devices with things like even more 
security-based uh, solutions or energy or elder care or those kind of kind of things. Uh, but in terms of the use cases, um, what people are doing with these devices, we're seeing a wide range of things. It's things like convenience, things like automating chores or taking care of pets. Um, that's a common use case. Also, peace of mind, things like closing the garage door after you leave home or checking on that um, or detecting when the baby's crying or the dog is barking. Um, also, safety and security applications have seen things like when uh, there might be movement or other anomalous kind of behavior when you're not at home. Um, and immersive entertainment experiences and also lighting. There's a lot of uh, lighting examples that people use it for. But underlying all of this is really a, a smaller set of consumer mindsets, like the mindsets that consumers have about their smart home. And that is that they want the smart home to enable them to, to do less and to do better and also to be safe. So when people think about their smart homes, they want, they want their smart home to make you know, their life be easier. So just automate routine things that are going on in the home, uh, but also to do better and things like spend more time on things that they, they really care about and things with um, family, friends, wellness, and, um, and so forth. And then also just to, to be safe. So these are these are consumer mindsets that people have, but sadly, in the smart home, it's actually not been like all roses. You know, these are great use cases, but actually, the smart home can be very complex for many users. Um, it can be really confusing on how devices work together, um, and it also can have a really high learning curve, like learning what devices work. Together, if you think about a uh, a light switch, like a, a, a physical light switch is pretty easy to understand if it's on or off. And if you have a digital light switch, uh, you might have to take out your phone and use it, or there's an automation. Maybe if you click that light on, who knows what else will happen? So there's confusion around like, well, what is going to happen or what should happen? And so this can lead to a lot of problems in the smart smart home space. But in addition to um, user problems, it also can be very challenging for device makers to build uh, smart devices too. So if you think about the smart home as it has existed in the past, it's been relatively fragmented. There's been lots of protocols to support, um, lots of integrations to make, there's lots of uh, support requests and things that you have to deal with as a device maker. And it's challenging, it's um, hard to build. And it actually has been reducing device makers ability to innovate. If you think about a, a light bulb company that makes a light bulb and then they want it to interoperate with uh, other smart home ecosystems, that device maker needs to build an integration for each ecosystem that they want to support or each other brand that they want it to interconnect with. And each of those represent engineering work, support costs, et cetera. Um, so this has been, been challenging. Um, but consumers really, they have expectations that are, <clears throat> that are different than that. You know, when consumers talk about their smart homes, they're not usually talking about protocols and integrations and technology stacks. Their, their expectations are things like, they'll say, I want my home to anticipate what I want. I want it to require little effort. I want to be able to just live in my smart home and use it and not have it require a lot of extra effort. Um, you know, want it to learn about me over time, maybe get smarter over time. Um, to be able to serve my whole family or maybe serve even guests that come into the house and not just the person who put the smart home together, but can work for anybody in the home. And also to be able to play well with all my devices. You know, consumers just want their stuff to work together, seamlessly be interoperable. This is, this is what they want. 
but those expectations are not really fully being met, you know, to date in the smart home industry. So with all of these challenges that I've just, uh, I've just described, uh, the industry has come together into this new standard called Matter. Some of you have perhaps heard of it. It's been under development for the last uh, three years or so, but it just was announced publicly as the 1.0 version of the spec late last year. So this is really very new. So you're, um, you will be hearing a lot more about it uh, coming up. So I want to tell you a little bit more about what, uh, what matter is and what it means. So first, um, what is matter? Matter is, it's an open universal standard that makes smart homes better for users, also for device makers, and also for channels. So uh, channels have a difficult time with smart devices because there's a lot of returns on smart home devices due to confusion or the, the onboarding process maybe didn't work the way the user hoped. And so it's a challenge for retailers too. So what matter is, is it's, uh, it's simple. So what it does is it's, it's a mark on the side of a, a box for uh, smart home devices that says that that device has been certified to work, uh, to be compatible with matter. So you can think of it like a Wi-Fi logo or, uh, um, or Bluetooth or even US, USB, uh, where it, uh, the, the consumers can purchase those devices with confidence and know that it works with their setup. Um, it's easy to set up and control Matter devices with multiple ecosystems. So if smart home ecosystems support Matter, like SmartThings does, we were one of the first companies to be uh, Matter certified, and we announced that just days after it was possible to be certified. So any matter device that you have works with smart things. So any ecosystem that you have, if it supports matter as a consumer, you have high confidence that what you're buying is actually gonna work with your setup. It's also uh, interoperable. So um, users can choose you know, which devices and ecosystems to connect. Matter has a feature in it that's it's called multi-admin. And it lets you actually administer a Matter device from multiple ecosystems or apps. So if you have one smart plug, you can add it to Samsung SmartThings and control it there. And you can add that same device to your Google Home setup. And you can also control that same device there. So it has this concept of multi-admin. Multi so that's, um, that's very interesting. And then uh, from a device maker's point of view, developers can build for one ecosystem just once and they don't have to do it over and over and over again. So it saves tons of time. Um, it's also reliable. Matter as a protocol standard, and I, I don't intend to get really deep into the, the technical parts of the actual the Matter spec, but it runs over a uh, thread. And so it's a, a mesh network protocol that's IP based and works really well for low power wireless devices. So because of that, the mesh network um, connectivity, the reliability is very high. And also you can do local IP communications with those devices right inside the home. So the interactions are very fast, low latency and high reliability. And then finally, it's, it's uh, secure where devices are actually authenticated before they join the network and uh, locally connected devices have encrypted communications there too. Now, this is a, you may have seen that XKCD comic that talks about standards where we say, we've got 15 standards. What's the answer? Maybe we should create an, yet another standard, which is really just adding to the problem. Matter is, is different um, in that it really has the backing of essentially the entire smart home industry. So uh, there are 300 plus members of the Matter Working Group. You can see many of their logos here. These companies, they've brought their technology, their best practices, their business models, and also their commitment to make Matter succeed. So this is um, the vast majority of the smart home market and the brands that are there are behind the standards. So 
this is this is very interesting and unique in the sense that it's not just a standard for one segment of the market or one kind of type of device or even one ecosystem. This is really cross-cutting and applicable to the whole market. So it's really fascinating how that has come, come to be. Before we get into a little more of the story of like, like what happened with Matter to uh, get it to the point where it is today, I wanted to share a short video. It's about a minute. And uh, gives it gives you an illustration of uh, of um, some of the challenges that Matter is intended intending to solve. Just want to make sure the audio is shared. Okay. The Zoom audience. Right, thank you. Okay. Thanks. How many setup screens does it take to turn on a light bulb? That's because setting stuff up can be daunting, sometimes with dozens of steps to get through across different apps, Wi-Fi passwords, logins, account linking, resetting devices, and that next smart thing you buy from the store? Odds are it needs a totally different setup. No wonder so many smart home devices are returned because of setup issues. But Matter changes the game by making devices easier and more consistent to set up. Most Matter stuff can be set up in seconds, connected to the network, smart speakers, displays, TV, everything, in just a few steps with the app I feel most comfortable with. Oh, and once it's set up, Matter's multi-admin feature means I can connect devices to other apps and controllers all at the same time. Now, everyone in the home can control every device however they want, using any phone, TV, smart speaker, or app they like best. Because everyone deserves to be in control of their home. So you can see that um, one of the big challenges that Matter solves is actually setup. So on average, before Matter, to set up a smart home device, it took, and I'm talking on average, 32 steps from the user that took eight minutes. And this is average, right? So in many cases, it's taken a lot more than that, in some cases less, but with Matter, that simplifies it down to four to five steps that can be done in a few seconds. So <clears throat> this drastically um, helps the setup uh, challenges and then in turn gives consumers uh, more confidence um, that they can they can actually easily set it up. It also reduce, uh, reduces returns for devices. I had mentioned this stat before that 36% of consumers experience difficulty during setup, and that translates to a lot of returns. And so this um, matter standard really helps with reducing the rate of uh, of product returns as well. Did all of those companies that we showed up on the screen, did they all participate in creating the standard or were there any that they were taking? Yeah, so yeah, the, the question of did all of those companies participate? Um, yes, the, the Matter Working Group, um, they worked together. So there was a, there's a smaller, smaller working groups that worked on aspects of the, of the spec and the standard that were there. And then there was uh, chances for all of the member companies to give input and be able to help guide, you know, what was the ultimate um, result. Yes, thank you. Now, devices that are supported today, I mentioned that the Matter 1.0 spec was just released. You'll see on the left side of the screen is the, the types of devices that are supported today. These are the most common smart home devices, things like HVAC controls, like thermostats, door locks, um, uh, also lighting devices, and um, safety and security sensors. There's other types of devices and categories that are under development today. And those things include like cameras, robot vacuums, and also other categories around like energy management. So uh, that is under development um, and under active development uh, right now. Now matter as a layer, if you, if you imagine all of the devices in our homes becoming more interoperable, first of all, it's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, the spec is there, which means that now device makers are starting to develop devices that are compatible with Matter. There's ecosystems like SmartThings that are ready 
to add any matter device and you can buy those today but there are more that are rapidly coming onto the market and it will take a little bit of time for consumers to be aware of it and for these devices to hit the market so uh, you will be seeing a lot more about about this in the future and in the meantime the matter spe spec will be continue to be developed now <clears throat> what matter enables and this is i really wanted to get to this part is the innovation that it enables um, so if you think about this um, low cost devices in the past they were the barrier to develop them and then make them be market successful it was pretty high because it, first of all you have to develop the device but also then you need to pick which ecosystems it works with which protocols it supports um, how to help people when they have trouble onboarding them and so <clears throat> matter allows it, it lowers that barrier and allows companies to more easily create low-cost devices it also allows companies to create more premium devices, those same companies that are spending less time developing against all of these uh, fragmented protocols and integrations can use that very valuable R&D time to develop premium features and things that, <clears throat> that actually go above and beyond just what's defined in the basic matter spec for onboarding devices. So it, in, so it increases and fosters innovation on both sides, both low cost and premium types of devices. And this is one of the reasons that it's been adopted so well, because it really fits to so many different types of companies. <clears throat> it also enables emerging use cases. So things like uh, elder care, um, energy, um, you know, other, other types of use cases that um, are sustainability based perhaps, that developers can spend more time developing solutions that work for those use cases and last time just developing for specific products because it's um they don't have to spend as much time because of matter and then finally it opens the doors for immersive multi-brand experiences so example would be if you have a tv and you have a lighting company and you can you know show sync the lights to the tv so that you know what's showing on the tv uh also synchronizes with the lights. So we actually have this uh, partnership today between Samsung and Philips Hue. So if you have a Samsung TV and you have Philips Hue lights, you can sync those two together and you can have immersive like gaming experiences. Or if you're watching movies where the lights in your room actually change in similar fashion to what colors are being shown on what you're watching on the TV. Uh, so that's just one example of these kind of cross brand immersive experiences that are are possible when devices more easily work better together now i want to show a couple of examples here samsung has a flagship store in new york city and um, it's called the samsung 837 building it's open to the public you can go there it's also a, st a store so you can buy smart home products there um, but when you walk inside, it's actually a full smart home experience. So you can see what a modern smart home would look like. Different use cases are demonstrated there. Um, and then you also can buy smart home devices, you know, on the first floor of that store. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a tour of that. Sometimes these, I wish I could just take you all there with me right now and show it to you in person. Um, but it'll give you a little bit of a flavor of some of these experiences that are possible when devices really start working together. So one of the rooms I wanted to show you is this, uh, the terrace room, it's kind of an outdoor, outdoor space. And in the terrace room, there's examples in there where you can, uh, you can set the vibe or the mood of your, you know, your outdoor area. Uh, there's things like, uh, you can create memories and share memories with like pictures, sharing them on the TV. Um, you can, um, uh, uh you know, you can also um, get notified if your friends arrive at your house, you know, if you're actually outdoors and then they're there, you can get notified on your phone or on the TV when people arrive, or if a guest leaves your fridge door open, you can get notified of that. So there's a lot of neat um, experiences that are shown, are shown there. Now, one of the other ones that I wanted to show you was, uh, was this one, which is the living room area. And so the living room area, there's things you can do 
with smart home use cases there that are things like like setting the mood where you might uh, be watching a movie and you want to set the lights to like a movie mode, but also close the blinds that are in the room to um, shut out the light uh, that's there. Um, you can also do things like start a social viewing experience where you log in with your friends to be able to watch the same thing together, even when you're apart. You know, those are experiences that are possible where you can have those kind of social interactions, even when you're not physically together. Um, and uh, you can also do things like not miss a beat. If it's like uh, you're watching a sports event and you go to the kitchen, you can mirror what's on your TV to your refrigerator and be able to see that while you're preparing appetizers, you know, for the, for your party. So that's some, some of the use cases that are shown there. There's also a room uh, there and a bunch of use cases around laundry and home gym. Uh, so, you know, example use cases here, like if you are starting your workout, you might want to set the room up for that. So that could be changing the lights. It could mean turning on music, turning on the air purifier and lowering the thermostat to get ready for your workout. Um, be able to get real-time health coaching through your TV and then be able to more easily do kind of post-workout routines where, you know, you get clothing recommendations from your washer and what to wash, uh, delay the start of the cycle to get, so it's uh, running at off-peak times where energy is cheaper, um, and then be able to be notified on your phone or on the TV when your laundry's, you know, done. So it's another example room where there's tons of use cases. Uh, detecting leaks is another common one in here with leak sensors in uh, like a laundry room. And then the last room I wanted to show you is one with um, the kids and gaming den. There we go. So this is for the kids and gaming den. So there's things you can do here with like setting uh, the mood to like level up you know, your live stream if you do do that. Or I've mentioned before syncing the lights in the room to what you're watching on TV or or your whatever you're gaming you know at the time you can have the lights uh, synchronized to that um, but also make different kinds of transitions for rooms like this happen more these are often multi-purpose kind of rooms so transitioning the room from things like uh, study mode to play mode to relax mode and having different parts of the room adapt and change uh, based on how that room is being used at the time, or or even do things like elevate movie night magic by being able to project movies, you know, on the wall, being able to set the um, uh, the lighting scenes and things like that in in the room itself. <clears throat> now, there's there's this is just a taste of examples, and there is so many examples for innovation that are happening here. I have a list here of. Uh, I mentioned elder care before. Aging in place is a big one. Uh, there's examples, many examples in here of being able to have a caretaker watch over someone who's aging in place and being able to respond if their behavior changes from day to day. If they wake up and have coffee every day at 6.30 and then that changes and they're not up and it's 7 or 7.30, then it can trigger a caretaker to go check check on them and make sure everything's okay. Um, there are many, many like spatial compute, metaverse, extended reality type of applications that are possible in aging in place kind of situations of being able to have a caretaker actually um, uh, sort of like virtually enter into the space or help the, the person who's living there be able to see what's going on in their space, you know, assisted through things like AR. The, there's a huge array of possibilities that are there for these use cases. Um, when you think about homes now more than ever before, actually, you can think of it as an API for your home where you actually can access the, the digital versions of the physical devices in your home. So uh, whereas before, if everything's different and it connects different and the APIs are different, that just is really limiting when it comes to want to doing, want, wanting to do 
whole home kinds of applications or even these kinds of um, immersive um, kind of AR, VR, extended reality types of applications. The other ones are, you know, you can you can read there with health, health and wellness, um, many different uh, accessibility kind of applications. There's one here, which is uh, taking automations with me. And that one is, think about taking parts of your smart home with you as you maybe go to a hotel, for example, or being able to have, um, obviously being able to interact with your smart home while you're remote in a car, uh, but thinking about portability, like where people are versus where their home is, there's lots of interesting applications um, ahead in that. And sustainability and energy efficiency is is huge. And uh, we're in the middle of a, an energy crisis, you know, around the world right now. So that's a uh, very top of mind for many people. Now, in all of this, I wanted to share a few learnings um, from Matter. Now, these are these are things that over the last three years we've been really involved closely with the development of the matter spec and helping to bring these companies together. And there's there's a number of things we learned. And so I wanted to talk about these. One is simplicity, is that simple solutions are better for consumers, but that doesn't mean they're simple to create. Actually, the some of the most simple solutions are the most complicated to create. So uh, it requires complex problem solving. And if you think about what, how to solve very complex problems, you have to break it down into parts, get diversity of thought. You have to really think hard about some of these very simple problems where in the smart home, one of these big problems is just how do you onboard a device? Well, that's like, it's a pretty simple question, but actually the answer is very complex. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it needs to be simple for the user, right? So. Um, that's one is just really focus on simplicity at smart things. This is a huge driving force for everything that we do is to simplify technology in a way that enables meaningful connected experiences. So we really focus on simple, 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 because it has to be simple for the user so that they'll use it. <clears throat> the second one is pragmatism. It's easy to overlook pragmatic kind of solutions to complex problems. You think about this, a user, when they wake up in the morning, they are not dreaming about how do I onboard my next IoT device? What protocol am I going to use? What is it going to integrate? They don't care about that. They just want it to work, right? So if you think about commissioning, onboarding, smart home products, it's not the most like sexy thing to work on. You think it, it's not like a flashy feature. It's not this uh, AI kind of driven thing. It's like a basic common user journey that's so central to everything that you do. And that that is the problem that matter is really solving. And it's very much worth solving. But when you think about problem solving, whether it's in this space or any other space, sometimes the ones that are the most mundane, the most common, the most everyday use cases, those are some of the most valuable ones to solve, even if they're not quite as uh, flashy, so to speak. <laughs> Constraints is the third one. I think we all are aware that constraints can really be an unexpected kind of catalyst. You know, if you have constraints, it can cause you to think in new ways that you didn't otherwise before. With, with Matter, the types of devices we're talking about are in a smart home, they're, they're often resource constrained, they're battery powered, they have a very small amount of compute, memory, storage, and so they can't do very much. And this has hindered some of the smart home progress in the past because there maybe was wonderful standards that were developed or ideas that could be <clears throat> could be implemented, but these resource constrained devices are not powerful enough to run them, right? So uh, Matter really took that uh, front and center in the problem solving to be able to come up with a solution that can work for these very small resource constrained uh, devices. Uh, diversity was one, the diversity is absolutely essential to healthy innovation. In Matter, these, these 300 plus companies that were all involved, each one of them had different uh, markets, different types of products that they developed, different 
competitive strengths and weaknesses, uh, financial positions, technology stacks. And uh, that diversity was actually really important for Matters Success to embrace, like not to say like, well, let's, it's too big of a problem. Let's only look at these types of companies that just have these very specific types of products and profiles and then just solve that because what would have resulted is a standard that only worked for a part of the market. But, in, but by embracing the diversity of products and devices and brands, uh, it really enabled matter to think holistically about what would work for the whole market. And then the last one that's uh, so important is timing. So, you know, you think about the, the right solution at the wrong time is really the wrong solution. Timing is, is everything. Now, with Matter, there's a few examples. Five years ago, Matter would, thank you, Matter would not have been nearly as successful if it was done five years earlier because uh, the user pain wasn't maybe quite as high. The pain from the device makers, they didn't quite feel it the same way. Um, if you look inside the standard, there's certain technologies like the thread protocol, which is a great protocol, but it didn't really have the success that it's now having as part of matter because it wasn't really the right time. The same thing, there's an application layer on top of this uh, standard that's based on the Zigbee cluster library. It kind of helps define like how you interact with smart devices. Well, when it was part of Zigbee, it was a great solution, but it was like running on the wrong foundation. So the Zigbee layer was is not IP based, but Thread is IP based. So now if you take Zigbee cluster library and run that on top of Thread as a basis, and then you have the timing in the market of when it's available, all of a sudden now these solutions have incredible value because of the timing that they got pulled together. So to me, this is critical, whether you're an entrepreneur, or you're creating a product that is like a marvelous product or a marvelous product idea. But if it's not fitting with where the market's at or what the market needs at that moment in time, you may find that it actually doesn't succeed at all because that product market fit is not right. So always, you know, think about the timing of solutions and not just the solutions, you know, themselves. So, um, I want to leave you with one, one last quote, and this is one that I love um, that is from Margaret Mead, which is, uh, which says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. If, if you think about what has happened with matter, it might be easy to imagine it as like, while well, these big companies got together and they did this thing. But in reality, it was a much smaller group that really had the ideas, the strategy that rallied stakeholders from many of these companies together that then created what is now a smart home industry standard that crosses the whole thing. But it really started with individuals and a rather small group. So I wanna encourage each of you as you are thinking about solving problems. And if there's problems that you're facing that seem like either too big or maybe some other big company should solve them, like it doesn't work that way. It always works with individuals that are committed and they're passionate and they're driven. And this world needs people like you all to be thinking like that. So I just wanna encourage you to you know, be inspired that even with the story of things like matter, it really started with a relatively small group of people that really believed that they could make it make it happen. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, there's contact information for me up here. Feel free to reach out to me and connect with me. Um, and I think we have a, a few more minutes uh, left, so I'm happy to take any any questions that you that you might have. much mark um i'm gonna just stop share so that we can see the online any questions from our in-person audience 
And for the online audience, feel free to raise the hand um, so that we know that you have a question. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so I really appreciate how you brought up uh, aging in place in the context of smart home. Um, I'm curious to hear your thought on the key factors that contribute to the success of a product in the aging space. Uh, what will be the biggest challenges or will it be addressed through the design process or the product delivery? Mm, good question. With aging in place applications, um, as with any application, you have to think about the user that is users that are involved. And first and foremost is the, the person or the couple that's aging in place themselves. What do they need? Now, solutions today, uh, they can wear lanyards around their neck. If they fall or they need help, they can push the button. They usually don't like wearing those. Like it doesn't, it's, it's not comfortable. It's like gets in the way. They maybe don't want to wear it. They're not used to wearing it. <clears throat> and so um, solutions that can help detect falls in the home without wearing the device or being able to have that person uh, call their caretaker for help without having to mess with a bunch of things on them, like the, making that a simple process. Because um, when you think about people who want to age in place, they they don't they don't want to go to another home, or maybe they have memory problems. And actually, changing where they live is actually can set them back significantly by making a change. And the more they can stay stay in place, the better. Um, other things to reinforce like connections and memories with people they care about. So being able to connect not only with whoever may be their caretaker or caretakers, um, but also being able to help them with memories of the past to get access more of their long-term memory to help them remember those things, like those are important. And then on the flip side, do you think about the caretaker side and what caretakers really need? Uh, they, you know, if their phone is constantly giving them notifications, like false positives of things that they need to be worried about, like then they, they will start ignoring them because they're sort of useless notifications. So making sure that they're like meaningful, actionable kinds of things, allowing that caretaker to connect with their loved one is important out uh, there. And then I think with all smart home applications, like simplicity is really, really important um, to just make the user experience, like how does it work? Why does it do what it does? How do that needs to be easy to understand, easy to use, easy to explain. Um, so those are just a few thoughts on that one. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question about um, the, the how matter is working for trying to promote the integration of many different devices. And you talked about earlier about you know, when you're getting new devices, about trying to you find it in one brand specifically and going down through all their product line or um, because I've, I've found in the past of trying to find that balance of companies trying to prioritize their strengths with maybe some of their technologies and making them more exclusive, but then also trying to integrate that with other devices quickly moving to that home where it just feel like there'd be a lot of multiple devices as we get more invested in this. So I was just curious, I understood that you're really optimizing the engagement of setting the products up, but then how are you, how is it integrating them together? Yeah, great question. Well, I mean, the first part of that question with uh, different brands there, I think it's normal when when there's a lot of innovation that happens quickly in a new space, people tend to build a little more siloed applications. They don't quite know what they're doing. In fact, you know, many metaverse applications are kind of like this, where they're sort of disconnected. And how do, how do you connect together? What standards can allow kind of interconnection between this? It's like the level of innovation that's happening is like very rapid, it's very fast, and standardization is like it would be nice, but it's like there's too many other problems to like solve there. Smart home has suffered from that um, in the past where there's just not been a lot of standardization. There's even things like, like Zigbee that is sort of a standard, but there are also very custom ways to use Zigbee that become proprietary. Um, and so when companies have that choice of what to do, they might say, well, we don't really want to be like open and standard because maybe that company makes a small like sensor device and if they just support an open standard then all of a sudden they lose 
a lot of the value that they have, which might be more at the application layer. So they'll be like hesitant to open that device up because they feel like they're giving away like a competitive strength. Mm -hmm. So this is where I believe like the timing around matter is important because the industry has, it's growing fast and it's gotten to a point where actually the lack of standardization has become a limiting factor to growth, even of those kind of companies who historically have done more proprietary kind of solutions because their users have realized they quickly run into the boundaries of what's possible to say, I can work within this little walled garden of what the company provided, but what if I want to go over here and work with this lighting product and with this lock and with this thermostat, and all of a sudden they run into limits, and then that becomes a limiting factor that way. So um, <clears throat> matter does define, it's the, the onboarding process, but also like how you do basic things with some of those, uh, when I have those list of devices on the left and the right, some of those common device types, it will matter defines how you can even interact with some of those basic devices, but there can be more premium things that that device can also do that's above and beyond matter that matter spec doesn't define for everybody. So it allows more innovation there but this is, it's a hard game of like figuring out where to draw the line of like what needs to be in the standard versus what is extra, like competitive differentiation. And then how does that line sit? So there's been a lot of thought that's gone into the matter spec to find where those right lines are to make sure that the whole industry can adopt it, but also gives plenty of room for innovation and differentiation. I think Valentin has a question. Yeah. Hello. Hey, um, Mark, thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting talk. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Matter. For, for 10 years ago, we, we uh, worked on, on some technology where this standard at the time, I, yeah, it would be a different reality. Um, one thing that I wonder, I, I mean, I work for big corporations. I know how among corporations, everyone can be friends and uh, build these standards out. I wonder um, now that we have a standard and we have this like universal API to the home, um, how do you see among the companies doing cross marketing opportunities? And also how do you see uh, startups that want to bring up new innovation that come up with ideas, you know, now they have an API to the home and it's like, a totally new landscape but is there in the community of the matter standard is there some kind of agreement like hey we should foster these people we should allow them to do marketing of on top of our hardware or you know like now we have this api for the home but if a company wants to use the api on top of the hardware infrastructure they might have to they might have to stand on the shoulders of all of you giants but mm -hmm. uh, is there thinking around how can you enable them to do that? Because traditionally you would probably block that or you won't, would want to block that. Hmm. Yeah, so one of the things with Matter is that it's um, it's very easy to, uh, to even like create your own Matter ecosystem in a sense. So the Matter standard, you know, applies to devices themselves. Um, that they can be compliant with Matter, but it also applies to controllers. Um, that those devices connect to. So um, like smart things is a matter controller. So certified to be a matter controller. So you can connect matter devices to it. So in that sense, then the things, the so-called API to the home, you know, you're really accessing it through the ecosystem that's supporting your, your matter devices. If you don't like that ecosystem, you can switch it to another matter controller that you may like. So with if you're using smart things as that primary uh, controller and interface, you can do things on smart things that work with any of those products that are in your home. Um, so there's really no limits, you know, to that. Um, but the same is true if you have a different matter ecosystem that you use, or if you wanted to create a whole new one. But I think it really does open the doors, you know, Valentin, the second part of your question around innovation, it does open the doors for like uh, startups, low cost device makers to be able to create matter devices that really work with 
these ecosystems and these matter controllers, and they can do they can do any marketing that they would want, you know, on that for their devices and be able to market that it that it works with matter. There's a broader question around marketing, which is like, how do you inform users that matter even exists, you know, to train them in that? I don't know if that's the question that you're asking, but that is another challenge that's really ahead of us in the industry. And that's up to the brands themselves. It's also the alliance that's behind matter. It's called the CSA, the Connectivity Standards Alliance. They're doing a lot of work in this area. And also retailers, if you walk into Best Buy and there's an end cap around smart home, you know, Best Buy, you know, has an opportunity to educate users there about like what, how do they make decisions about what devices to buy, which ones are interoperable and support matter and which ones maybe aren't. So that's a, that's a big challenge too, is like the, the marketing around the education of kind of what matter is. Hmm. Maybe to follow up. That's the question. I think what is what I just realized, what's really interesting, because of matter, if you want to enter the smart um, home market, before you had to enter it with your own hardware, you had to build something to put it up there so that you can have software in the market. Now, mm -hmm. after the matter standard, you have, an, you, have a, you have an API to the home, so you actually can run with a software startup you you now the stack just moved a level higher so you can be in, entirely software and still and, and onto the, the the smart home market which i think is a really really interesting important point yes absolutely i'm glad you pointed that out and that is absolutely what it enables that that kind of in, that software only even innovation like that that doesn't require you to actually produce a device in order to to innovate in the smart home I have one last question, maybe we can wrap this up. Um, um, you mentioned a lot about uh, personalization and customizability to each user's needs. Um, that requires it's the device's knowledge of who you are, who the user is, what they're doing. And there's, of course, concerns about privacy and even just the ability, how, how much information do the device actually need to know about the user to be able to provide the service? I wonder if you could talk a little about that now that all the devices are integrated in the same cloud system, meaning that maybe there's some shared data across these, these devices, how do you mm. actually protect the user? Or maybe give the user a sense of trust that they can actually safely integrate all these things into home. And home is a very sensitive environment yeah. as well. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And it's uh, there's we could talk a long time about privacy you know, in this space. But when you think about a, a smart home ecosystem, if you're using it and that ecosystem is matter certified, so it's it's a, a control a matter controller, and so you can add devices to it. The the app that you use to interact with those devices, like in the case of Smart Things, it's the Smart Things app. So you're using Smart Things as the app. You're using the control the matter controller that comes with Smart Things, and then you are as a user, you are intentionally adding the devices that you as a user want to add and you're controlling your smart home using that ecosystem. So the matter certification itself doesn't um, just mean that all of a sudden every device in your home is going to start sending data wherever. Like you still, as a user, have control over the, the transparency, how much data that you, you know, want to uh, be able to collect, what devices actually connect to that smart home like that is up to the user to decide that um so it's not not just that all devices just automatically are connected without user consent if that makes sense yeah, yeah. awesome thanks um, that was amazing yeah uh Valentin, do you want to close this session yeah i i have it's not rather it's not a question it's more like a uh um like where, where, like, if you have the whole classroom in front of you, and probably a couple of students are interested to get their hands on matter and see how they can, uh, you know, integrate that with 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 their classwork and so on. Where, where's the best starting point for everyone uh, to get involved with matter and and get started? Yeah, so um, you can get a a matter enabled um, hub from Smart Things. Uh, there's a number of options. We actually have a standalone 
uh, Smart Things Hub that you can buy that in addition to Matter also supports Zigbee and Z-Wave and some other protocols. So it's a very flexible kind of hub. We, we also just launched recently a, a device that's very cost-effective and I think it is really cool. It's called Smart Things Station and it's a charging device. So it's an inductive charger for your phone. So it, you can use it like that, but it also has a Matter Hub built into it. And it also functions as a smart device. So it has a button on there that you can click, double click or press and hold and you can trigger automations. So you can do things like when you go to bed at night, like many people do, put their phone on the charger right beside the bed. And even that act of just charging your phone can trigger routines and that kind of thing. We also have the hub functionality built into 2023 Samsung TVs, family hub refrigerators, and also some smart displays. So many of those choices, I think like the SmartThings station is a great option to start with. And it just was announced in January this year. And uh, you can buy that or the standalone hub. If you have that device and you have the SmartThings app, then all it is, Valentin, is just uh, finding Matter compatible devices online, buying those, and you can integrate those and start using those right away. And then the benefit of having smart things is that there's also many other kinds of devices, even ones that are not yet matter certified that are like Z-Wave, Zigbee, or even cloud to cloud connected types of products that also you can integrate with and work with your matter setup as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark, thank you so much for, for visiting the lab and, and uh, give the students the opportunity to, to learn from you. And um, a fantastic talk, thank you.